Welcome to God Talk. I'm Pastor Dan Smith, uh, recently a pastor of a church, but now with LOBN and Quiet Hour and God Talk. <laughs> I love our set. I love our picture. I love the little music they start us with. It's an honor, and it's an honor that you're here with me. Obviously, we're still building a, uh, a brand as a show and getting the word out that we have a show about God, sermons about God. And uh, as I retire and begin to, we'll build a website and we'll build some things together. But thank you. Tell some others and just say, hey, we're hearing sermons about God. Talking a little bit about when you're afraid of failing. I... Uh, used to have a nightmare. I went to college at a place called Pacific Union College 45 years ago up in Northern California, and you dream of this chance to go back and preach at your alma mater, which finally I did get to do one time. Did a week of prayer for the uh, Koreans up there. But um, I had this chance finally to preach for like a big day, you know, like graduation, let's say, or alumni day or some big day. And I'm in my guest room, and I, and I can't find a sermon. And I'm panicked, and I, I can't find a sermon. i got to preach. And then I can't find a white shirt, a, a dress shirt to wear. And I race down to the market that has a hardware store. They have no shirt. I go to the bookstore. There's no shirt. So what am I going to do? And I'm racing. I can hear them singing, and I know I'm going to have to preach and walk out. And I don't have a clothes. I don't have the sermon. And I'm going to blow my big moment. And then you wake up. My grandfather, who was a great preacher, regularly had dreams about walking out onto a sermon with no clothes on. And you're not ready. And you're going to fail in front of everybody. Story I heard years ago about the uh, lady who was a director of a choir, children's school choir. They've been practicing since August for the Christmas concert. Finally, winter is here, and December is here, and 200 kids are sitting up there, and all their parents are there, so let's say 500 parents. And in walks the choir director, old lady, gray-haired, bows to the congregation. And when she bows, all the kids, because somehow she had gotten her dress in the bathroom stuck inside her girdle. They never even seen a girdle or heard of a girdle. But here this lady had this in a girdle, and she doesn't know it. What are you going to do? And then the lady turns, and she now was ready to direct, and the whole crowd sees this. And every woman in the crowd, oh, no. And one young mother jumps up there, quickly pulls out the lady's dress, and now the lady knows what's happened. And she's embarrassed, and she has failed, and she will never live this down for the rest of her life. For years afterwards, people would say, remember, remember that night when failure. I uh, was asked to do a series of evangelistic meetings in my church in Chicago. Boy, this is, this is 93. They were not able to find a professional evangelist who did this all the time, so they said, Pastor Dan, you're pastoring the biggest church. You do it. Me? We'll support you, but you be the speaker. And it was terrifying. I had a bunch of funerals those few weeks. I had two little boys, one new baby. Difficult, difficult time. Write new sermons. I've never done this before. Finally came the first night. 600 people are out there. One of my friends bought me a new suit. I killed myself for this sermon. Wasn't sure it was going to work. Back in the back room, praying my heart out. And not only am I preaching to my church and whoever guests we had, but I'm preaching in front of my other 10 or 12 pastors who are with me in this project. And I could hardly get a word out. I was so scared. I preach all the time to people. But somehow the pressure of this scared failure. It's hard. Remember the night I went up to ask Hilda to marry me? Scared to death. 
Back then we used a watch, an engagement watch. <laughs> I had a watch in my pocket, scared. Would she say yes or no? Marrying a pastor, divorced pastor, scared. Every time we have a program where there's going to be like a luau, where there's Hawaiian dancing, we're going to Hawaii tomorrow. Uh, I'm always afraid that they're going to say, they always seem to want me to be the one. Even last week, they had a Filipino dance with the bamboo dance. And what do they want? Pastor Dan, take your shoes off. Try to get it timed. Luckily, this time I got it. I do not know how to hula dance. I don't know how to dance at all. Never learned how to dance. Afraid I'm going to embarrass myself in front of the whole place. Afraid. Afraid. The famous story of Elisha and Gehazi. They're in a city, and it's surrounded by enemies. And Gehazi opens up the window and sees there's chariots and horses, and there's people, armies everywhere. And he said to Elisha, what are we going to do? 2 Corinthians, 2 Kings 6.15. What shall we do? What's the easy first lesson that every preacher has preached on this? Why do we forget? Why did Gehazi forget? Everything else that God had ever done. You read back over these chapters. They are some of the most powerful chapters in all the Bible. There's 11 miracles in about six chapters. Raising Shunammite's son back to life. Whole valley filled with water. Army blind. Water purified. You know the stories. Jars of oil being filled over and over again. And somehow Gehazi forgets all of that. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're in trouble here. And we forget. He knows the stories. He not only knows the stories of what have happened with them, he knows all the history of Israel. He knows opening up the Red Sea. He knows all the miracles. Why would he doubt these? He knows Elijah's story, the fire coming down out of heaven and people believing in God. We forget. I forget. I was in Thailand a couple of weeks ago. They asked me to build again another church that we built years ago. A friend of mine and I helped build a church in honor of my father. $150,000. That was a lot of money. And now, instead of six or 700 students, it's 1,100 students. And they need a new church. You say, Pastor Dan, can you help us with a new church? And it's easy to forget <laughs> what God has helped me do in the past. When we built that church, after the dedication, we've just dedicated a church that God has given us all the money for it. And a Thai lady, the Thai principal, said to me, we need one more, Pastor Dan. Not what I wanted to hear. I said, what do you need? We need an ad building. I wanted to be done. I wanted to get out of Thailand and go home, pastor my church. They didn't want to be raising money for another huge project. Feel the pressure. She says, we need an ad building. I said, how much? Probably a quarter of a million, 250,000 U.S. And I forget. I forget about the time when a lady caught me New Year's Day and said, Pastor Dan, I sold the house. I want to give you $30,000. And I walked away from the parking lot that day with checks totaling $35,000 and built two or three churches and a school out of that. I forget about the funeral where at the end of the funeral, the guy said to me, Pastor Dan, I just sold a building. I've got $10,000. Can you use that? I forget all those stories. What are we going to do, God? Forget how he's helped me in the past. I was at uh, KSGN radio program dinner years ago. They passed out $100 bills. Anybody want to take $100 bills as long as you promise in 90 days to see what God will do with this $100 and multiply it for God. I stood up. They gave me the $100. I didn't know what to do. Then I heard that the college I'd been helping, Salusa University in Zimbabwe, people were starving, faculty starving, living on $20, $30 a, 
month because of the terrible economy. Now, I began to talk about Seleucia University. My college, which was La Sierra University, had some faculty who had taught there, grew up there. We together began to spread the word. We raised $11,000 to share with our fellow faculty in Zimbabwe. I happened to be speaking right here at Loma Linda. I did a Sabbath school for some reason. Someone invited me to speak for a Sabbath school. And I, I think I told that story that we were going to go over to Zimbabwe. And people lined up, wrote me checks. Make a long story short, I think the $100 became 18000 which grew then. We had to build a farm. We got water. We got a $250,000 grant to get water, $60,000 grant for the farming equipment. God did a lot of good out of that $100. And I forget those stories. What are we going to do, God? What are we going to do? And I forget. Where is it for you? Maybe you're starting a business, <laughs> or they want you to go to a job that's going to be much more stressful. What am I going to do, God? And you forget what God has done in the past. But if you think about it, if we didn't take some chances, we would never go to the moon. Eisenhower would never have gone into D-Day. Europe would all be under Hitler and Nazism. Somewhere, someone has to say, we're going to go, let's go. We're going to take those beaches and we're going to save the world for freedom. If we didn't remember how God has blessed us in the past and take some chances in what was new, if we let the fear of failure stop us, there would be no new medicines, no bridges, no rockets going out into space. No internet, no computers. There'd be no Garden Grove Church that I just was pastoring at if no one was willing to move past the fear of failure to die. So what's the answer? We never forget what God has done before. My brothers and I have three younger brothers. We were all together this weekend for my retirement Sabbath. And we like telling stories. We grew up together. When we get together, remember, we know the story already. We didn't forget, but we want to tell it again. And our four wives all say, why do you have to tell the same stories over and over? We like the stories. It helps us remember. And Christianity is a historical religion. We remember what God has done in the past. And so we believe in the future. Wonderful little book called Watership Down. These rabbits were in a little warren. And now they're being taken over by new construction, and so this Moses rabbit leads them from this warren to a new promised land. But whenever they're in trouble and they're going to be wiped out, they go down into a hole in the ground where there's a little more room, and the rabbits would huddle in there, and the storyteller would tell the great stories where they stole cabbages from the white man or whatever it is. And at the end of the story of these great victories of the past, and the rabbits would be calm again, and they'd be ready to go on their exodus a little farther to the promised land. The power of stories. What God did once, he can do again. When Joshua was coming to the Jordan River, there's the promised land, and it's flooded, and how are we going to get across? There were people who said, don't forget, God did it before at the Red Sea of Moses. He can do it again. Remember. Remember. Daniel 6. Daniel is saved in the lion's den. God shut the lion's mouths. Down in Brazil a few years ago, there was a guy who became a new Christian. He was talking about his faith with some other friends. They said, you're such a great person of faith. Jump in the lion's den and let's see if God can do it again. Now, you have so much faith. The guy does it. Climbs over the fence and goes where the lion is. The lion comes running over, sniffs all over him, goes back and lies back down. God did it again. He did it once and he did it again. And all his friends became Christians. <laughs> Still do it. What God did once, he can do it again. Going to Vietnam, every few months, there a few months ago, we went up to see a church that we helped build. 
We raised, I think, $20,000 to build the church. While I'm there speaking for that one night, they said, can you help us with the children's wing? How much do you need? $25,000. I don't know where to find $25,000, and it was $40 altogether because they needed sidewalks and cement. I talked to one donor. I said, can you help us with a few thousand, just get it started? Enough cement for the front. She said, I'll do the whole thing. <laughs> really? Wrote us a check for $40,000. The mission leader who was taking us around heard about it the next day. I thought he would be happy. We got $40,000. we are going to build your children's center. He's upset. I said, what do you mean? Why are you upset? He said, I was saving you to help save money raise money for the Denaing Church, the next city we were going to. They took our property 40 years ago. We finally got some property back, and we need to build a church, $120,000. I wanted you to raise whatever money you can raise for that church. And I said, my dear friend, God has more money. And if he helped us get the money for that church, he'll help us get the money for your church. We sat down with a napkin and we began to write it out. 10,000 for quiet hour, 10,000 for the union, and 10,000 for him, 10,000 for my church, 10,000. We wrote out a bunch of 10,000s. We emailed everybody that said, we got to do it together. If one doesn't do it, it won't work. And we all did it. And I dedicated that church last March. It's done. Beautiful church in the name. If you did it once, you can do it again. Don't forget. Jesus was with the disciples, and the storm comes up in the Sea of Galilee in the boat, and the disciples are freaked out, and they say, God, what are we going to do? Jesus said, why are you so little faith? Have you already forgotten about that and that and that and that and that? Do you really think the newspaper headlines are going to be the next day? Jesus died with all his disciples and drowned. We forget. Don't forget. God has never lost I was watching as a young college student when the Lakers, my team, won 33 games in a row. We were listening when Miami got close, hoping that somebody would beat Miami so they wouldn't take our record. I was in college when UCLA won 88 in a row. Bill Walton, these other great players. These great winning streaks. Edwin Moses, win every year for years. No losses. But they eventually lose. God has never lost. Jesus never lost 33 years, never lost one time. God has never lost. Why would Gehazi think, well, God has won before, but maybe he's not going to win today. What are we going to do, God? No, God is not going to lose. He never loses. Not going to lose. When I was a young pastor, my friends and I thought there would, might be a day when the church would just kind of die out. We could see that the old people who were supporting the church, they were faithful, but they were dying out. And the ones who've been giving the money would eventually, there would be no more. The next generation wasn't buying in. They're not going to buy. They're not going to give any money. <laughs> but here we are. 2,000 years, the light has not gone out. Every generation has somehow passed on the torch to the next generation. Lights are still on. Church is still going. We're told the church may seem about to fall, but it is not going to fall. Apple of God's eye. Louis Armstrong, they say that he got old. People would come and challenge him. He's been the best. Maybe not the best anymore. They'd come into the clubs in Chicago or in New Orleans, and uh, the young guys would come with their new trumpets, and they would, they would stand up and play their latest song. And people would give them a standing ovation. Okay, 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 he's taken over. Maybe it's time for the old champion to fade away. He's had his time, but no more. But when they were all done, Louis Armstrong would uh, take out his trumpet, and he would say, you all, you all done? You all done the best you can do? Yeah, that's it. And he would get out his horn and play Dixie or When the Saints Go Marching In. When he was done, they would all know the old man was still the champion. <laughs> he still had it. 
He was not ready to move over yet. And it may look that God is not the best, but he is the best, and he will still be the best, and he can did it before. He can still do it again, whatever you need. Don't have to be afraid. And what did God do for Elisha and Gehazi? Elisha prayed to God, and he said, God, show him. Show him. And God pulled back the curtain. And now Gehazi could see the horses and chariots all around. In 2 Kings chapter 6, 16, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. We have more chariots. You can't see them with your naked eye. But we have more than they have. Don't you be afraid. No reason to be afraid. Don't be asking me, what are we going to do? What we're going to do is I'm going to show you God has more horses and chariots. The Bible says he who was in you is greater than he who was in the world. He's undefeated. He's not going to lose. What do you see? Do you see the enemy? Do you tend to be the one who says, I don't think we've ever done that before. I don't think we have enough money. That's not going to work. I tried that before. That's not going to happen. Or are you the one who says, don't be afraid. We have more with us than are with them. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Don't be afraid. And the Lord opened his eyes and saw the hills of horses and chariots of fire. Do you live by what you see with a naked eye or do you tend to live by faith and see what God is going to do? Do you see God's horses and chariots? Or do you just see whatever is there? What are we going to do? Zechariah 4, verse 6 says, Not by sight, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let me give you three little quick answers as we begin to wrap this up. Number one. Don't forget what God has done for you in the past. Don't forget where you have seen God, where you have altars, where God has been in your life, and you know that God was there, and he did not drop you. He will not drop you again. He will be there for you. These altars that God has built in your life in the past. If he could do it then, do it. And you can see what God has done for others, and he'll do it for you. Number two, don't worry about what other people think. Don't give these other people space in your head. We can't do this. There's not enough money. I didn't, it didn't work for me. It won't work for you. Don't give them any space in your head. Leave them out. Negative people. Be people who see the horses and the chariots. The hills are full of horses and chariots for God. Number three, if you have to fail once or twice, at least you were in the game trying. And give God another chance, and eventually it's going to work out. We call it the man in the arena, Teddy Roosevelt. Easy to be the critic talking about the bull fight and telling he should have, he should have, he should have. Easy to be the critic sitting up in the stands, the man in the arena, the man with sweat, with the red flag and trying to find a way to be in the game. At least you're in the game. May fail here once in a while. But we're in the game trying. And over time, God is going to come through. And the hills full of chariots and horses will win the battle. Can I say as quickly as I can, God is a constant. You don't have to worry if God will be off and on. He was there before, but he won't be there. He's there for other people, but he won't be there for me. He will be there. He is a constant you can always count on him. Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not Malachi 3, 6. Nothing separates us from the love of God, Romans 8, 38, and 39. I go over those verses over and over again. He can quench every one of the fiery darts of the wicked one. You don't have to be afraid of what God will do. And Elisha takes a whole army, and they all go blind, and he leads them to the city. And the king says, what should we do with them? 
want me to kill them? He said, no, feed them a great meal and let them go back to their place. God, the power of God, of what God can do. Now I got to finish one more thing before we're done. One more part of this story. Elijah is getting old. He gets Elisha to now be his associate. They come to a river, to make a long story short. They cannot cross the river. There are no boats. There's no bridges. But Elijah is a prophet. He takes a prophetic coat. He wraps it up and hits the water, and they go across. Elijah says, you know I'm going to be taken, yes. What do you want me to give you when I go? He said, a second double portion of your Holy Spirit. I am not who you are. I'm going to need much more. You will get it if you see me when I am taken. A little while later, here comes a chariot of angels swirling out of the sky. Elijah swept up and away. The prophetic coat comes to the ground. He picks it up. He goes back to the same Jordan River. It's still flooded. There's no way to get across. The young people are watching to see if the power has jumped from the original old prophet to the new young prophet. And Elisha wants to know too takes that coat and he hits the water and he cries out, where now is the Lord God of Elisha? And it works. He did it once. He did it again. God is a constant. If he did it once, he'll do it again. He will always do it. We're sometimes afraid when we kind of come to these rivers that we cannot cross. And someday we're all going to come to a river that you cannot cross and you can't cross on anybody else's faith, not your pastor, not, I just retired, I'm not going to be there. You can't go on mine. You can't go on your parents or your grandparents or your pastor or your church. You have to have your own relationship. You hit the water, where now is God? And know that you have a God in your life. There are those who say that there will be a time without a mediator. We'll have to go it alone. No, there will never be a time when you go it alone. He says, he ever liveth to make intercession for us, Hebrews 7.25. Lo, I am with you always. I will never leave you. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God will get you to the other side. God is a constant. You don't have to be afraid. He brought you this far, and now he's going to drop. What are we going to do, God? No. The hills are full of horses and chariots. And we're going to go across to the other side. You don't have to be afraid. Our God is good, and he's good all the time. So if you're having a hard moment today, I pray that you'll hear this message. God will be there for you. He's been there before, and he'll be there for you today. This is God Talk. See you next week. God bless.